seems that everybody's here, so maybe we should start. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm, let's do this properly. Thanks, I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity. And it's great to see that there's such a large Scala community because about two years ago when I started programming, I think there were about three people in Israel. So who, who played with this? So it's good to see that everybody is getting into it. Uh, my name is Oferon. I'm a data scientist with Flyperson. And I use Scala every day for all the tasks, including working on Hadoop using Scalding, all our, uh, all our production code, and all the research tasks using for qu quick scripts. And I'm going to share with you what I learned through experimentation, mostly, and for reading quite a lot and playing quite a lot, how we can use Scala's type system to get our code to be much more concise and generic at the same time. And first, a disclaimer, I'm far from an expert. I'm sure any of the guys from uh, Martin's lab could probably tell me I'm saying quite a lot of wrong things. But this is what works in practice uh, without having to go too deeply into the mechanics of the type system. So, OK. Uh, so Scala, Scala's type system, as you know, is very powerful. It's actually Turing complete. You can, you can cause the compiler to crash during type inference if you really want to. Don't know why, we, why you would, but it is that powerful. Why is it this powerful? You can state very, very precise con constraints on your types, which means that you have very strong compilation as assertions that the code is going to work. On the other hand, most of these constraints are inferred by the compiler. You could basically you could get quite a lot of this done with Java, but you would have to tell the compiler each time all the types you're using, which means that every short line would be preceded by a lot of the diagonal brackets we all know and hate, and the compiler saying, I don't know what this is. Can you please tell me? I do not know what this is. Can you please tell me? So just a brief introduction. Types in Scala are basically any class, trait, or object define a type, and anything which is preceded by type something is a type. The way I look at it, which is not the way it's stated formally, but it's the way I, fi I find the most useful to think about it, is a set of expectations and guarantees. When I look at this method, for example, I can see exactly, can, can we even see the pointer here? Not really. OK, here. I can see that he expects to get both a list of type A and then of type B, and a function which works on both of these types, and it turns a B. This tells me quite a lot, and in, quite, uh, in many, many cases, just by looking at the type signature, I can know how to implement what I want to implement without even thinking further about the details. The, the great strength about this is that many, many things can be known in compile time. And basically, this entire lecture is going to be based on stuff you can know at compile time. We're not going to care about the runtime at all. By the way, that's the reason nulls are considered such an evil, because they're exactly where the runtime bleeds into compile time when something returns a null, which is just ruins the entire type in the entire program. There's, no, there's nothing there. You can't really talk about it in a well-typed sense. And any reasoning you did is going to be wrecked. OK, so how does roughly type inference in Scala work? It looks at the constraints you stated very roughly. It tries to solve equations for them. And if it can uh, solve the constraints for them, it will compile. If it can't, it's going to tell you, I do not know what this is. You have to tell me. Usually, it's a very good sense that you're doing something wrong. For example, here, I did not have to write that this is a function from double to an int. Because that's what the compiler expects. Basically, I told it that's what to expect. And this is defined on a double. So the type is a double. Everything's fine. I do not have to write explicitly here what I'm looking at. Another note, in Scala, types are inferred locally. They're not global, meaning that they're inferred always in the same parameter group. Basically, it's, this is best illustrated by an example. Say I was writing the same fold with the elements, the seed element, and the function. 
when the compiler tries to infer what it's looking at, what A and B is, it's going to know this is a list of ints, this is a double, but you have to tell it explicitly that this function is from a double to an int, because, uh, because this entire equation has to be solved simultaneously. If, however, I write this in two parameter, group, in two parameter groups, this is an int, this is a double. This has to be a function from a double and an int to a double. You do not have to write it explicitly. If I wrote this here, it wouldn't know what I wanted. It would compile and tell you have to write explicit parameters. I can't infer this. OK. So we're going to be playing with a toy example. The reason we're going to be playing with a toy example because this is basically the only example that can start to show you the power of the type system without getting too deep into the mechanics. So our entire grammar is going to be based on elements which look like this, which, is, which are basically contract, constructed like this. Expression can be anything, or a list of anything, or a map string to anything. And basically, all the examples are going to be what is a string, like this. And what I'm going to show you, that this has quite a lot of information. You can use it at compile time to save you writing a lot of code. Where in Java, this would be, OK, this, I have a map of something to something. And that's, where I, that's where I'm stuck. And anything else, I'm going to have to get through by reflections. In Scala, this, is, this entire thing is discoverable. I can actually reference the type of this by looking at the entire signature without writing a single type hint. So let's say I wanted to print a nice compact representation of this grammar. Something sort of like a JSON, because this, this is basically, it's sort of a JSON, if you look at it, and this grammar, where the end values are always strings. And the JSON is uniform. You don't have an object or a list. You always have either all objects, all lists, all objects. It's a very limited form of JSON. So I can write this very quickly. This is how I print the leaf of the JSON. This is how I print a map. This is how I print a list. But when it comes to using it, if I want it well typed, I'm going to have to explicitly write this out. I'll get the output I want. This will compile. But it's basically worthless. Why is it worthless? Because if in the middle of writing my script, I decide, no, I wanted the map from a string to a map, this is broken. Anywhere I use this, just broke. I have to go and reformulate this which is quite annoying when you're trying to work and can break your build in very unexpected ways just because you forgot to change one place. Can I have some? Yeah. Why don't we write just a pattern mesh, right? A single function instead of all these fancy printers? Because, uh, of course, you can do this with pattern match, but you can take this example to a much more powerful place from this pattern. For example, I'm not going to get into the lecture, but I use this for higher, higher kind of types, where I had an M of something to something and an L of something, which behaves sort of like a map. Type classes behaving sort of like a map and sort of like a list. And the entire action still follows through, even though I couldn't pattern match because I didn't know what I was getting. I was just using type classes. OK, yes. thanks. Basically, almost all the things I'm going to show can be done in other ways. But there's another b problem with pattern matching, which you know well. I'm going to know it's going to break when compile time, uh, runtime, basically. OK. How am I going to solve this? I do not want to write everything out. Scala lets me add implicit parameters to methods, meaning if I can place a constraint on the type I'm, I'm using and use this constraint for my actions, I can get the code to basically write itself. The, the implicit parameters are always going to be the last parameter grouping. This is where we go back to what I said before about the types being inferred by the compiler, because in the last parameter grouping, you can use all the other types you've already inferred. And what can be used for implicit parameters are methods, object values, which are explicitly marked as implicit. You can't just use anything, and this is to prevent you from getting behaviors you, you don't expect just because the compiler grabs the first. I wanted the implicit int, the compiler grabs the first int it sees and says, OK, this is, good. this is what you meant. If I can find such a candidate in a single, unambiguous way, the compiler will work. Otherwise, 
it's going to say either I didn't find a good candidate, or I found I can't find a good match. These are the matches I'm finding. Which one did you mean? There are very strict scoping rules as how to make this possible. I'm not going to go into too many of them. They're complicated. They're well worth reading. And even then, after reading them, sometimes you have to play around a bit to understand what you're seeing. As I said, this is not a lecture for experts. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, implicit lookup is indeed complicated. It could be simple. OK. <laughs> so basically, we all used implicit parameters without noticing. Anybody who's written even a basic script in Scala has used this. There's an implicit parameter which you don't really look at because you never called it directly. The codec is brought in implicitly. The place it is, there's, an in, there's a fallback system codec. Technically, not on codex companion object, but on a trait it inherits from, which brings on in the default character set of the system. You can always put in whichever parameter encoding you want, but if you don't specify anything, it's not going to tell you you forgot. It's going to use the default. Very sensible behavior. So where am I going to find implicit entities? I can either import it directly. The elephant in the room. Can Can you give the lecture instead of me? It's an Android. <laughs> I win the most original interruption of the lecture, I think, is from somebody streaking. Interrupted by Android. Is this going to be on the video? Because I want it. <laughs> so once everybody gets the pictures, we can continue. So basically, you can import your implicit entity directly. This is done as a usual import with the following caveat. If you try to import two different implicits with the same name, you're going to get the last one of them, usually, or you're going to get the compiler complaining about ambiguity, which means you need to be careful. Otherwise, there's an implicit scoping of the types involved, and there the rules get complicated. I'll just give you one as an example, and this is the simple one. If I try to use a method defi defining a parameter of list string, it's going to look both in the companion object for list and the companion object for string. This is the simple one. The more complicated ones is when you have types with different subtypes and different constraints. And then basically, sometimes it's quite hard to know where things are coming from. I recommend this book. I'm going to plug it here again by Suraf. I think it's with uh, type, uh, TypeSafe, right? No, right? Yes, he works. Yeah, and uh, this book does an excellent job of showing you what can go wrong and what can't. It's the best book on this uh, subject I've found. OK, so this is the same print, only doing things implicitly. Meaning, I have this straight, and I have this object print, which want, says I'm going to try to print V, and I'm going to assume that I can find an instance of print V. And I have this identity, identity instant, instance. I'm not saying what it does. It's not interesting. I have this instance which can print a map. And I have this instance which can print list. And then the usage becomes quite simple. I import this. I import this. Here's the same signature as before. This is all I write. This will always compile. Even if I change the signature, this will still compile. There is one. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at this again and see how. So I'm trying to print, and I'm trying to print a map. So it, it says, here is print map. It's implicit. So I'm going to use that, because it's the type I want. It's a print for map string v. To print this, I need this. Now, what do I have? I have a list. So I'm going to use this. Then I'm going to use this. In the end, I'm going to use the identity, because I don't have anything special for string. I'm going to use the identity. Now let's look at some very, very subtle point here. Notice in the imports. I didn't import print underscore and then printing underscore. Why, why did I not do that? If I would have done that, I would have imp imported this also, the identity print. 
the compiler would have said, I do not know what you mean. Do you want identity or map? I can't decide. By selecting what I import, I'm saying basically, you guys can use the identity because it is in your scope. You can use the identity because it's in your scope, but I can't use it directly. When working with implicit, you need to be very, very wary of what you import. The wrong import can get you basically something not compiling, or worse, something compiling, but not what you want. OK, now for the next part, which is more complicated, we're going to do a slight interlude and talk about covariance and contravariance in the Scala type system. Basically, we've all seen it. We've all gotten the cryptic. You're trying to use a, parameter, a covariant parameter in the contravariant position. This is where this comes from. Scala type system is quite complicated because it tries to handle two things at once. It tries to give you very generic type inference and subtypes at the same time. That's quite complicated. I know that every time I say it has a, strat, uh, it has a strong type system, if there are any Haskell programmers here, they're sniggering. But because of the subtypes, the job is much harder. That's, by, by the way, one of the reasons the compiler is so slow sometimes. Yeah. It's trying to infer using the subtypes. So I have this basic relationship of the subtype. If I can substitute A when you're expecting B, I have covariance. In Java, every method is basically covariant, meaning it's not really covariant in the sense you would think in the type system here, but you can send in a subtype. It's going to treat it as the superclass it expects. And the return type is truly covariant, meaning you can return anything which is a subtype of the type defined in the interface. If I am willing to accept B when I wanted an A, this is called contravariance. The errors are reversed. OK, where do we meet this? Assume we have a method that wants to get a list B, a list of animals. And we have a list of dogs. It makes sense that anything taking a list of animals should work on a list of dogs. It makes sense with the caveat that this is an immutable list. I'm going to get to it in a moment. So in the collections library, the type parameter for a list is typed with a plus, saying anywhere the compiler accepts a list of Bs, if I send it to a list of As, everything is going to compile. Why is the immutability important here? Because with mutable lists, if I pass you an immutable list of cats, and you're expecting a list of animals, then you put a dog in it. My, my side of the code, the calling code, isn't broken. It still thinks it's losing, looking at a list of cats. When it tries to get the cats out, it's going to get a dog. Everything is going to uh, collapse and, uh, with a class cast exception. If you, see this in, if you look in the library, you're going to see this. The mutable collections are all invariant. The mutable list collections are almost all of them marked correctly, except for set, which for some reason is invariant. But I think it's something which has to be fixed at some point, since it makes no sense again. Another example of this is the function. Function, we can see, is contravariant minus in the first parameter. Covariant is the second parameter, which means that if I have a function from any val to an int, and I'm expecting a function from int to an any val, this should compile. Why is this? My function takes something, does, applies itself to it, and returns b. It takes an a, it returns b. Now, any super type of a, any function which can take a super type of a, we already said, can eat an a because it's a subtype of the parameter. And any, any function which returns a subtype of b can be treated as returning a b. I'm going to lose the specific type, but it's still, it's a b. Meaning that this would work. And basically, this is a principle used in quite a lot of the collection libraries to get stuff to work, like map, flat map, stuff like that. OK, now we're going to try and get a type system to do something more complicated for us than the printing. Assume I wanted to write an evaluator for my grammar. I want to be able to query this. I want to be able to query this, for example, grammar using a key and then an index. I can always write this, right? This is perfectly legal. This would compile. But I do not want to use this because I'm later, go I'm later going to want to both be able to query further in a type safe way which I can still do if I just limit myself to functions. But I also want, want to be able, using this sort of grammar, at key, foo, at index three, 
represent my queries. For example, for some sort of string serialization. I can't do this with the usual functions because the function has a very specific serialized representation. It's only in code. I can't really get this serialized and get it back and rebuild it using function in a human readable format. I'm going to have to use standardization or serialization of some sort, which is very prone to breaking, as we all know. The code versions are the same. Boom. So can I get this evaluator, type safe, so that once I have an evaluator from full to map string string, now I want to specialize f further. I want to evaluate the end map again. And I want the compiler to tell me if I'm trying to specialize at an int, at an index. Basically, I want a class. I dropped all the path building because this is just why I would want to not work with the queries. It's not interesting, but the details are here. I want to somehow get a, a class or a trade going where I have functions, specialize at key, return, an evaluator which goes deeper into the map, or at index, an evaluator goes into, ah, this is an error. This is the solution. I'll fix this later. But we want, we want these to exist only for the appropriate types. We can do this in a non-type safe manner by checking explicitly what we're seeing and throwing a class cast exception or an operation not support exception. But we're only going to see this at uh, runtime, which is precisely when we want, don't want to meet these errors. Can we do that? The answer is yes. We actually have some bits of production code which do this. And the way we do it is using all we've seen before, the implicit, the covariance, and contravariance. And basically, you've all done it too. You just haven't noticed. Let's look at this example. I have a list of ints, and I have a list of tuples. If I try to call to map on this, and to map is a standard library function, it's not going to compile. If I try to call to map on the list tuple, it's going to compile. How does the comp compiler tell the difference? Basically, if you ever look at the libraries, this is the answer. And this is quite deep. We're going to have to understand what goes on here. We're trying to place a constraint. We have a list, which is traversable once. And the type parameter is sometimes an int, sometimes a tuple into string. And we're trying to do something which should be illegal in some sense. We're trying to constrain the type, type parameter to look like a tuple, and saying this should compile only if the type parameter looks like a tuple. But we can't constrain it using the method, because A is external to method. A comes from the outside scope. If I try to write A here is a subtype, so T and U, it's both not going to compile, because it's going to need the type inference, because of parameter sets, if I don't give it some sort of evidence. And it's also going to be a new type parameter A. I can't, it's going to shadow the original type parameter. A good, a good idea is going to tell me this, but I can't redefine A here. So I needed some sense to be able to tell it, I want to work only this to only work when A looks like is a subtype of this tuple. And basically, this little thing looks weird. It's not a keyword. It's not a reserved word. It's code. And this is where it comes from. If you look in the Scala pre-def, we have a type definition. This is, again, a type definition with two parameters. Let's look at this. It's contravariant and school variant. It actually, it's actually, actually a function. It's not important for to what we want to say. It's important for the usage, but it's a function. And there's only one of these in existence, the singleton, which is a new conforms operator, let's call it. I have no idea how to say this otherwise, from any to any, with the obvious applica application. And there is one way to get a conforms for A. Simply cast this. And here is the kicker. It's implicit. So what's going on here? If I have this implicit evidence parameter, which I want A to look like the tuple, or A to basically look like B. I'm trying to look, um, it tries to solve for type B. In our case, it uses all the rules of type inference, and it finds these D and U because A looks like T and U. A looks like int and string. It then tries to find this type. OK, but it's not going to find this type, right? There's no way to get an A to a B. We know how to get an A to an A. 
But if you recall, it's contravariant. If A is really a subtype of B, if I'm expecting an A to an A, an A to a B, I can use B to a B because of the contravariance. Which means that basically, this B to B is going to be a subtype of the request A to B, and this is going to compile. So we can use the same, let's do the same trick. And let's look at this carefully. So we have this evaluator, which can evaluate. And what I'm telling you is this. If I want to evaluate at a key, then I want B to look like this. If I want to evaluate at index, I want B to look like this. I always start with a seed evaluator. This has actually, in my implementation, has a private constructor. And I can specialize it further. So I, if I evaluate myself, I'm just returning some myself. And then I start to specialize, which means if we have a type full, which is this, and I want to evaluate from full to map to string string, this is going to compile. This is not going to compile. And you're actually going to tell, get the computer compiler telling you, I can't prove. I'm going way too fast. I can't prove that map string string is a subtype of list B for some B. Question? Yeah. Is it possible to get a better error message? Because, well, what the compiler will say is exactly like that. So what is it supposed to mean for the user? OK, what you can do, and it's good that Eugene brought this up, you can actually annotate this. I think since Scala 2.8, you can actually annotate and let the compiler tell you a much better answer. I couldn't infer this, some sort of a very specific answer, which will help you better. I haven't used it a lot, but that's because I'm mainly the user of this library. So. OK, now let's do a real example. Because all of this were nice toys, it is running in production. It's doing actually something more complicated in production. But let's do a real example. The usual equals method. Usual equals method is essentially, in a type safe sense, broken. You can write, and it actually happened to someone on our team, which wasn't very careful and shouldn't have been, didn't know yet. He wrote this. This compiles. He actually had a predicate comparing a string to a class. And this failed silently. So you're running this huge MapReduce job. And at some point, you're filtering. Nothing's getting filtered because the predicate, it was filtered or not. And predicate was always false. Compiler is not going to protect you. But we already saw that we can do nice things if we know the types. So why let the compiler not protect you if you can? There's an operator. This equals at the type level, which is similar to this. It's defined precisely the same manner, except it's not contravariant covariant, which means you can't accept subtypes. It will only work, only work on the exact same type. Now we, got, we come to a new type of implicits. The same way we did implicit evidence before, we can do implicit conversions, saying, OK, you, you might not want this type, you might want that type, but I can implicitly convert them for you. The way to do that is in Scala 2.10. In Scala 2.9, if you try this, you can't write implicit class. You have to define the class and do an implicit diff doing the explicit conversion. We're going to define an egg wrapper. Egg wrapper takes a type A, has a triple equals method. I'm using this and not two equals precisely because I want to know when I use this. I do not want any ambiguity overloading. And I get an element of type B. And I inspect an evidence saying that A is type equals to B. And then I do the usual equals. What's going to be? What's going to happen here? If I try to write this, I'm going to get in the REPL. I'm going to get precisely this error. I can't prove that int is a string, which is what we wanted to do. But a simple caveat: if I do an explicit casting and upcast them, we're back to the same scenario. It's going to compile, and we're not going to do anything wrong. This is a very, very important thing to understand. The compiler can't know more than what you tell it in the types. If you decide to upcast for some reason, that's what you have. The compiler is not going to know that this was an int before, and now it's an any. 
it doesn't look at the runtime information, it doesn't care about the runtime information. All it cares about is what's in the signatures. Signature says any, it's an any. This is going to compile, it's going to give you a false again. I have a question. Yes. So is it possible to write this without an import? So it's, it's quite annoying to write import EQ underscore every time. So what can be done? Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> so for instance, in your previous slide, right? You go back. Well, since Scala to tens of course implicit classes, maybe we can just put them at the top level without an enclosing object. We can, but it could be, I think, dangerous sometimes. I, th I, I in my in my practice, it's usually better to know exactly when you're importing. For example, because you have the same operator in the in the Scala test framework for the asserts, you want to know when you're using stuff. You can put this at the top level, but implicit at top level are dangerous. Can you? Actually put the class at the top level? Can you? Yeah, you can do it on the root package. Yeah. It's actually those two things generated. The dev yeah, the dev can do that. Actually, the compiler happens as well. I, I never played, but it makes sense. Yeah, it will, the compiler is going to generate the dev for you anyway, and it has nowhere to put it. So, And again, it's good that it, you can't, because it's bad practice, I think. You want to know where your implicits are coming from. Yeah, but on the other hand, you can put the stuff into a package object, right? It's still dangerous. No, you can do it. If it's a usual, we have some implicit, uh, implicit stuff in the package objects. But again, only when it's very, very clear what's going on. And this is. I believe this exists in Scala Z. Yeah. yeah, it is. But just that, uh, I think one of the smart things that uh, was stated in the 2013 uh, Adopt Scala manual is be careful of Scala Z. <laughs> and I have a PhD in mathematics. And most of it is in stuff which is category theory. And I still find myself times when looking and saying, huh? <laughs> and I mean, this is the stuff I actually wrote, you know, PhD about, and I still don't get what's going on there sometimes. So Scala Z is validation is wonderful. Some of the small stuff is very nice, but sometimes it's just better to be less specific and write down the sequence operator yourself, so you don't have to unravel about four different contexts to understand what you're, what's going on. I think we have a lecture on the good parts later. I'll be very glad to know there are good parts currently. I'm <laughs> This is a library for mathematicians, and very good ones. OK, now the caveats. And the caveats are quite important. The, fa the matter of fact is, the, f the, ma the fact that you can get a specific type or preserve your specific type doesn't mean that you always have to. Don't, it's fun in the beginning. I did quite a lot of times use path dependent types and type structs and everything. And it turns out that at some point, you're just doing it for the fun of it. You don't really need a specific type. And there's nobody else, even you, two months later, which is going to understand what, why this doesn't compile. Use it when it actually saves you coding later, and not when it would look really cool. And I can say, I did this very complicated stuff with Scala. For example, I wrote Scala Z. Use the type system and the implicits for libraries. Don't do it everywhere. If you're writing a script, there's no justification for getting all this stuff into it. It's a script. Get it working, get it done quickly. If you have stuff which is out of facing the library, like the to map, hide it well. Like the map, there are implicits all over the collection library for, the, for getting it generic. Anybody who's not a very good Scala programmer is going to work with this basically seamlessly until it gets to somewhere where you need to be slightly more um, judgmental in your imports, and it's going to get stuck. He's not going to know well, things, why things aren't compiling. Again, because the messages are something cryptic, because it's just it, there are too many concepts there. We haven't even touched view bounds. We haven't even touched type classes yet. And the last one. Compiler is slow. We all felt it. We all know it. Hopefully, it will get fixed at some point. If it can, I don't know if there are not some exponential stuff going on in the inference which you can't really crunch down. Any type game you add is going to make the compiler slower. Basically, I managed it while playing with uh, HList and stuff to get the compiler to work five minutes on two classes. Not proud of it. <laughs> Still don't know how I did it. So it could be a bug in uh, 2.8, I think. So, Use this only when you have to, it actually saves you time. 
Okay, as I said, I went much too quickly. So we'll take a lot of questions and I'll take, talk about real use cases, but all, this co all the code I use, it's not a lot of code, but you can play with the examples in the GitHub. Hopefully I'll get the lecture up there later. And again, Scala in depth, a must read for anybody who wants to do this seriously. It really is a must read. Do the exercises if possible, play with it, understand what's going on. There were times I spent two days trying to get something to compile, and if I just did, took my own advice and went through the chapter again, I could have saved me about 90% of the two, those two days. So, thank you. I'll take questions now. <laughs> and if Wix are allowed, we're also allowed. We're hiring both data scientists and software engineers to work on big data, no SQL, stuff like that. We'll be happy to. to Questions? Well, I have a question about the slowness of the compiler. <laughs> so when you said that so we should be aware of uh, type tricks making the compiler, s slowing the compiler down, uh, did you mean like all type tricks or some, some parts of them? I think any time you expect a compiler to infer too much, for example, I'll give you, I'll give you a real example using, I, I said before, does anybody, how many people here know what higher kinded types are? Okay, so I'll mention this in a, in a brief uh, moment. Scala lets you talk about uh, type parameters with type parameters. Since basically when you look at list, it's a list with type parameter A, it would be nice to talk about a list of something. It's not trivial, but you can do it. You can talk about a list and you'll see, you can actually pass in, and expect a type parameter, let me just, code is more convincing. You can actually write this. Can anybody see this? Or, uh, okay, let me. Okay, didn't plan on doing this, but it's important. Never mind. You can actually pass into as a type parameter that I want to expect a type of A and the list of something and use this. You can get a map of two parameters and actually reduce it to a precise type. It turns out that you can go through the entire example I did and say, I'm going to say that I have something which looks like a list. It takes one type parameter, it can be required by index. I have something which looks like a map with a string. And you can write the entire code with these somethings, evaluatable by index, evaluatable by uh, map, as map. And first of all, there's a nice little compiler bug that when you try to see if something conforms to this, if you write the parameters in the wrong order in the parameter group, it doesn't compile. And also, the minute you pass from this inference requiring only type of the list to an inference requiring both the type <laughs> of the list something and the list something instance, compiler just slow, slows down. Which means that any time you make the compiler work too hard for something, to solve the constraints you placed on types, you sometimes might get bugs. Again, turns out the parameter order in the same parentheses group can kill, uh, kill the compiler. It's not gonna compile even though it's perfectly legal. You change the types around in the same parentheses group, everything works, and you get slowdown of the type system. So again, look at what you're doing and see that the type game is justified. If it's justified, go ahead and do it. If it's only to say that I wrote this really complicated piece of code which can do a lot of stuff with, ty with types, don't. It's fun for games. Don't take it to production. There was an instance called, an, there was something called an H list, an heterogeneous list, where you have a list which is sort of like a tuple but unbounded. You're saying I have a list which is an int, a string, a double, another string, another int, and I know the type of every element, not like at compile time. I love the thing. I play with it. I, I try stuff with it. If I ever saw anybody putting it in production, I would probably either fire them or me if it was me. <laughs> You're fired. You're fired. <laughs> How many experts are there except you that are uh, working with that? Uh, well, at least five people definitely work on that code. Okay, and so that's, that's a good scenario when you have people on that. Currently, if I use that, even though my team has quite good Scala programmers, if I got run over by a truck, I think the, uh, an H list would probably just be erased and replaced by a regular list. And it helps to code through. <laughs> Even then, sometimes you have to sit down and understand why exactly things. Um, yeah. There's Miles. Uh, does anybody, everybody know Miles Sabin's shapeless library? Miles Sabin we wrote a great library showing quite amazing stuff you can do and get inferred. 
even reading through it and understanding it, going back a week later, sometimes you have to rework the logic to see what's going on there exactly. It, it is dangerous. It's fun to play with, but it's dangerous. So speaking of performance, I would like to add some clarification. So a, lo a lot of, well, the, the current way of, of doing type level computations, which uh, have been de described here, is to use implicits. So use implicits, implicits sum on other implicits, and so on and so on. So it's sort of like a type level prolog where, where you just declaratively uh, well, uh, describe what, what you want to get and, and as a result. For example, an implicit for this huge type, okay? And then the compiler does the interpretation for you. So actually, this, this whole stuff is, is powered by a sequence of implicit searches. And since implicit, implicit searches, they, they look through a lot of members in so-called implicit scope that was mentioned here that, that spans really a lot of code, it might be slow. So we can, we can look at it as follows. We have some language for doing type level computations. It's not even Scala, it's some DSL, and it's interpreted, so it's really slow. But on the other hand, there are techniques, and while well, in my talk I'll probably cover one of them, uh, that effectively amounts to, to this being compiled and this being actual Scala. So we have a DSL that's interpreted, but on the other hand, in Scala 2.10, we can have a compiled Scala code that does exactly the same. So it's not like it's bound to be slow. It can be slow, but it doesn't have to. Yes, I admit I haven't played with macros yet. I was waiting for his talk, so. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? OK. Can you put this presentation online somewhere? What? Can you put this presentation online somewhere, the slide? I'll talk to the organizer and see if we can uh, get everything on there. And I said the code is on GitHub. Yeah. And I'll fix the presentation also. And as I said, this is actually, it's not just games. We actually have something like this running against the legacy system where I needed to be able to query legacy objects in a type safe manner. I didn't want it to, the, the serialization of the queries to depend on reflections at the other end or to break if somebody changed the name of a member. So the queries are actually compile time checked by doing type checks against, a, uh, against code generated code. I haven't used macros yet. That's the pla next place I'm going to take that to get the mirror objects generated by macros. And then anytime you change a query, it will be compiled. And if somebody changes the name of the field, your code is actually going to break and you're going to know that you're safe. But you still get very high performance because you're not doing reflections. The query gets deserialized, gets compiled in some sense. And you know that if it was generated in a type safe manner, it's a valid query. Then everything goes through. Well, actually, I would argue about this very high performance thing. Uh, if you could s scroll down to one of the slides that shows usage of implicits. Oh, uh, not not this one. If you go back, way back. The print? Yeah, the prints, exactly. Yeah, for example, here. Here we can see that this implicit def print map, it depends on an implicit which prints an element. So therefore, you sort of compose a bigger, pr uh, a bigger printer from smaller ones. And uh, well, this gives rise to a hell of a lot of interactions, right? So to print something, you need to, to go to one implicit, you need to ask another implicit, and another, and another. And yeah, it's, it's, it's good performance. It's, well, it might be even great, but uh, uh, it, it, can, it's, it can be better. So let's, let's say it like that. So I imagine that uh, we could uh, completely remove these interactions. This wouldn't work. This would still use implicits, but, but in a different way. So, yeah. Uh, this po th is this possible with the macros uh, easily? Yeah, I just didn't want to say macros. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the macros, but later we see how easy it is to write macros, because the reason I didn't want to start playing with them, because it seems that to write them, you have to work very hard. Oh, so. I'm not going to go into this in my talk. <laughs> macros are wonderful, and how you write them is no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so thank you again. Thank you.